Acts chapter number 12. Let's get back in the saddle here. Acts chapter number 12. We'll try to close the chapter out this morning and then next week move on to chapter 13. And so uh, we saw the execution of James, the brother of John. And then we have been looking at the escape of Simon Peter. I said this a couple of weeks ago. I say it again. Uh, the Lord never does cease to amaze me. But uh, here we are at Easter time and we are in, just so happy we're in the passage where Peter is getting busted out of prison right around the Easter time in the scripture. And uh, I mean, I didn't plan it like that. There's no way I could have, but I did plan it like that. The Lord does stuff like that. Just kind of confirmation, let us know we're on the right track and in the place we ought to be at. So Peter's getting busted out on Easter. We talked about last week how it's a picture of a sinner locked up, can't get out. The Lord has to get in, set him free from his chains, loose him, and let him go. Peter gets out of the prison. The Lord opens doors for him. And then when Peter gets out, we looked at last week where he goes to. He's a picture of a sinner that's just got set free from a sin. Where does he go when he gets out? He goes to where God's people are assembled. He goes to meet with the church. And the reason he got out was because the church was praying. When God's people pray, sinners get delivered from the prison house of their sin. Here's the facts. I mean, I don't think anybody this morning probably would, I mean, maybe, maybe you, you would say this, I don't know, but probably none of us would say we got saved and nobody was praying for us. Um, I don't know, I mean, you know, maybe one or two of you, you could maybe say you didn't have anybody praying for you, I don't know. Most of us, I would say the majority of us would probably say the reason, one of the reasons we came to Christ and got born again is somebody was praying for us. Uh, have a mama or a daddy or an aunt or an uncle or grandma, papa, son, daughter, husband, wife, friend, co-worker, somebody at church. Somebody was praying for you and saying, Lord, that old boy's lost going to hell. Deal with his heart. God and Christ saved him. Lord, that girl, she's going to go to hell. You don't save her, Lord. Please work on their life. And because of those effectual, fervent prayers, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much, uh, you were drawn to the Lord. God saved you. Thank God for prayers. Thank God for those prayers. All right. So we're still looking at this escape of Peter and the last few little particulars on this escape. We come down to where this girl wrote up. Here's him knocking at the door. Verse number 13, Acts 12, 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. I told you last week, this woman's name means a rose. Her name means a rose. The Bible said in verse 14, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness. But ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Talked about last week, how every church needs some uh, need some road of roses. You know, some members who are glad to see people come. Not give them the sign, oh, why are you doing here? Even though she didn't let Peter in, it wasn't because she didn't want to, she just got happy. <laughs> she goes, man, hallelujah, Peter's here. You know, she's glad that he's there. Thank God for people that are glad when folk come to the house of God, come to worship. Man, I'm trying to stand in the foyer or somewhere around and I, I genuinely am happy to see people come to the house of God and come fellowship. You say, why? Well, for several reasons. One, it blesses my heart because I just like being around you. I enjoy God's people's fellowship. This is my crowd. If this crowd leaves me, if God's people leave me, I'm going to be up the creek without a pipe. I don't got another, I don't got a backup plan. So I like fellowship with God's people. I like it because you come with a desire to hear the word of God, to sing the songs of Zion. That's what I've come for. So we come for a mutual reason. I'm glad you come so I don't have to preach to pews. <laughs> Amen. I've, I've preached to people and pews. And I'd rather preach to people than pews. Generally, people give you a better response than pews. <laughs> Generally. Not always. I have preached to some congregations that preaching to the pews seemed like it got more done than preaching to those people did. Uh, but I like preaching to people. My ministry of people. I like preaching to people. I thank God you're here. And so she's glad they're there. And look what they say about this girl. Verse 15. She's glad. She runs in tells them, hey, Peter's at the gate. Verse 15. And they said unto her, thou art mad. Um, every church needs some folks that are a little bit crazy. A little 
books. <laughs> That's what Dumber said. You're crazy, woman. Every church needs some books. It's a little bit crazy. Yeah. I, I think our church got more than our share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Lord, I thought you were supposed to like disperse these people. <laughs> you know, just one or two here and there. Say, like, Lord, you made our church like the insane asylum. <laughs> but I can't say much. <laughs> he gave them the right pastor. <laughs> it's like, here, you crazy enough? Go no pastor, they're much crazy enough. All so you want to be crazy? Yeah. If I'm, if I'm crazy, just don't interrupt me. I'm enjoying being with my crazy. Anyway, they follow me straight back to the church, all the crazy and go down there. That's all right. <laughs> so I ain't never seen stuff like that in the Bible. I haven't either. I don't know where it comes from. I'm not going to blame it on the Holy Ghost. And they said unto her, Thou art man. Woman, you are crazy. But she constantly affirmed, I'm not, I'm not crazy, that it was even so. Here's a little interesting uh, doctrinal nugget. Nestled here, verse 15. Then said they, so they're going to they're gonna allow, okay, maybe something's out there. But Peter's dead. You know, they think he's, he's, he probably died. Then said they, it is his angel. They think it's his spirit that's at the door. You say it's an angel. I know, but that's what they, that's, an angel is a spirit. Look, as a matter of fact, hold your place there and go with me over to uh, Hebrews. Watch what your Bible said in Hebrews about angels. Look at Hebrews and chapter number one. Hebrews chapter one. They said it's his angel. They think the spirit of Peter has showed up. Like it's his ghost almost or something. Like they, they think Peter, oh man, he, God didn't answer our prayer. Peter got killed and now, you know, he's, he's in the beyond with his spirit has come to visit us. Well, look at Hebrews 1, 7. Hebrews 1, 7 and up, the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Come down to verse 13. Verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time to sit on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool, are they not all ministering spirits? Speaking of angels, are they not all ministering spirits? Send forth the minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Um, look at Acts chapter 23. I've got a note here for Acts 23. Let's reference here about. Oh, yeah. Acts chapter 23, verse 9. Now, I'm not saying that when you die, you know, you turn into an angel. You're a child of God. You're in the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. I don't think that's necessarily what they're saying. I think they're getting at not that Peter turned into an angel. It's Peter's spirit outside here. Because an angel is a spirit. Acts 23, 9. Well, we'll start verse 8. Because it's in verse 8 too. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confessed both. And there arose a great cry. And the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. And so that's what they're thinking has showed up here. They say, man, it's just like an apparition, a spirit apparition. His angel has showed up at the gate. And uh, that's what they think Rhoda's is seeing. They think she's gone crazy seeing something like this. Verse 16, verse 16, I like this. But Peter, back to our text, Acts 12, 16. But Peter continued knocking. Now, if, if Peter is a picture of a sinner that was locked up, then he got made free. He has followed the Lord. He has now showed up at the house of God. This is part of the Christian life too. Doesn't your Bible say in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew and other places, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. And it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened unto him. And so that's part of the Christian line too. Just keep on knocking. Just keep on knocking. You say, well, I'm, I'm asking the Lord to do something and it doesn't seem like he's coming through. And I've knocked on heaven's door and I've asked the Lord, well, don't quit. 
A-S-K. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Just keep knocking. Just keep asking. Now the Lord wants us to. So it says, verse 16, Peter continued knocking. I think sometimes we don't get some of our prayers answered. Now look, I know sometimes there are some things that maybe you're going to pray about, but it's just not God's will. It don't matter how long you knock, it's not God's will. I get that. But I believe in times like that, the Lord will end up making it clear. That's not my will and I'm not doing that. Okay, well, I'm, I'll start praying a different way if you will. But I will say this too, and I think there's scriptural precedent for this. But there are sometimes our prayers do not get answered because we are too quick to quit knocking. We're just not. The Bible uses this terminology in Luke 11. The Bible calls it importunate. Importunate means persistence in asking for what you want. Keep knocking. Oh, God. Oh, God. I mean, surely we have enough Christians in here that you've been saved long enough that you've watched what I'm talking about right now in your life. That you just kept knocking and kept knocking and it didn't happen the first month or the second month or the sixth month, but you just kept praying. And down the road somewhere, all of a sudden, God answered that prayer. Amen. But it took endurance, persistence. Keep on after it. Don't just quit because it don't happen in your time frame. Keep on knocking. And that's what Peter does here. And Peter continued knocking. He <laughs> let me in, y'all. Verse 16, when Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And this ain't just no spirit. This ain't just no angel. This is, this is really him. He's really at the door. Verse 17. But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their feet. He's holding his hands up like you know, they're all, how'd you get out, Peter? What happened? Man, and everybody's throwing questions at him. I thought you was dead. Didn't think you'd make it. What, what went out of it? Just, just hold on. Hang on, let me tell you about it. But he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their feet, declaring to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. I like that too. A saint who's been made free from the prison house of sin will have no problem going and testifying to others of how the Lord got him out. Isn't that what he does right here? It said he declared unto them how the Lord brought him out of prison. Peter doesn't walk in there and say, I'll tell you all, I prayed my way out of that. Busted my way out. Ninjaed my way out. Knocked them out, broke the chains, got myself out. No. He walks into that crowd and he says, I want to tell y'all what the Lord did. I, I was locked up, y'all couldn't get out. The Lord got me out. Isn't that our testimony of conversion? Isn't that how we testify about being saved? We don't stand up and brag on ourselves. We don't stand up and tell them what great things we have done for ourselves. We stand up and tell people what great things God did for us. That's what Peter's doing here in the text. It said, uh, he uh, declared to them how the Lord brought him out of prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now verse 18, we're fixing to shift from Peter back to the prison scene. So we've been at the house now seeing Peter Fellowship with God's people and tell them how he got out. But we're, it's like, you know, watching a movie and now the movie's going to shift back over to the prison scene where Peter got out. <laughs> it's not such a pretty scene when we get back over there. Verse 18. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. Obviously. I mean, I don't know how that happened. I don't know if, um, if it was like when the Lord rose from the dead. The Bible said the keepers of the tomb became as dead men. Like God knocked them out. He didn't kill them. He just made a light that made them sleep like dead men. Like, I don't know if that's how it happened when God gets Peter out or if he just like puts a film over their eyes and they don't even see Peter walk out. I don't know. I just know all of a sudden they come to themselves in some shape, form, or fashion. Ever how that is. Whether all of a sudden God takes the scales off their eyes or now they can see what's really going on or whether they, God put them to sleep, now they're waking up. Ever how this happened, all of a sudden, Brother Jason, they cover themselves, and when they do, they look between them, whence Peter was chained. 
And when they look between them and say, all right, big boy, it's execution day. You know. <laughs> Pete? <laughs> Pete? <laughs> Pete? Because <laughs> uh, now, y'all ain't in trouble. I'm fixing to show you how much trouble they can get. Uh, there's no small sir. They, they come running out of the prison and ask the guy to say, hey, did y'all come get Peter last night? Hey, oh, we ain't got him. Y'all no, ain't here. <laughs> well, you mean he ain't here? I mean, he ain't here. <laughs> they, bro, they got the red alerts going and, you know, prisoner alert, red alert, and all this. They looking all around the prison. There's no small sir. They're running everywhere. Every nook, every tranny, every room closet. They are looking for this guy. And they don't find him. And watch what happens in verse 19 because they don't. And when Herod had sought for him, so now the king comes down there wanting, wanting his pound of flesh. He's killed James, now he wants to kill Peter. And he comes down there looking for him. They're still looking for him themselves. And when Herod sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers. Now there's more to this than just him doing a uh, question and answer. This is examination that is done by the method of of torture. See, he comes in and he says, where's Peter at? We don't know. We, we were here all night. He was here and then man, he's gone. I don't believe that. And he tortures him to get the truth out of him. Even though that was the truth. You say, how do you know that? Look at Acts 22. Watch the scripture interpret itself. Look at Acts chapter 22. And verse number 24. Acts 22, 24. This examination in Acts 12 is obviously done through the method and the means of torturing this. <laughs> Acts 22, 24. The chief captain commanded him, this is talking about Paul, the chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging. Scourging. This is like the talk, you know, the Bible talks about they scourged Jesus. Like with the whip, cat and nine tails. That he might be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they cried so against him. In other words, they're trying to get the truth out of Paul. So the best way, you know, that's been done for ages and eons now. Um, you know, they have surmised in certain times the best way to get information out of the prisoner, if he won't talk, torture him. Now, sometimes I can work one way or the other. You know, I think, if, 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 I don't know how much books on torture you've read. Forgive me, I've read a little bit. <laughs> so that's sadistic. That's human history. It's military history and it's human history. That's very interesting, by the way. <laughs> anyway, so, hey, you're a sadistic individual. Well, leave me alone. Let me read what I want to read. You read what you want to read. <laughs> you go on read, you do that old book and read, you know, the world is a beautiful place and flowers and rainbows and puppy dogs and she gets the boy out again. I'm going to read about how they tortured this dude to death for not telling them what they want to know and it's true stuff. <laughs> Anyways, you want to really know how, you want to really know about mankind, you know, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Man is essentially good. Where do you, where do you, get, where do you get this from? Oh man, Man, there's there's spark of divinity in every man, and there's some good in every man. You ain't read enough history, honey. <laughs> read about depraved man without God. Mankind has never been so ingenuitive or inventive as when he is devising ways to torture or kill another person. Look at some of the greatest technology that we have in this world. You know what the greatest technology we have in this world is? It's all stuff with the intent of killing people. You know what a submarine is? That was developed in wartime, man. For what? To kill people. Where did the advancements of the airplane come from? So the Wright brothers doing it. That one where the advancements come from. It kind of stayed in an infant stage until what? World War I and World War II when they started figuring out they could use planes to kill folks. You want to read about people getting real sharp? They start torturing folks. They come up with wild stuff. <laughs> Anyways, how'd I get off on that? <laughs> Here they're going to scourge him. Find out the method by torturing. Oh, that thing can work one of two ways. 
Torture Court 102A. You can torture a man to the point where he's like, look, I'll tell you whatever you want to know, even if it's not the truth. Yeah. And then sometimes they torture a guy that actually did get the truth. Now, you know the way that we found how many of y'all, you know, how many of y'all rejoice over the fact that somebody like Osama bin Laden met his end? Right. You should rejoice over that. The Bible said there's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Amen. When the, the righteous rejoice when the wicked are put down. Amen. A wicked devil like that deserves what he got. Because sin is against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men are fully setting them to do evil. Thank God that joker got what he deserved. Amen. You know how he got what he deserved? Because the CIA and all those shadow ops places waterboarded them terrorists. And they waterboarded them to the point where they got information out of them so then they could find that sucker and shoot him. I, have, I proudly have a signed replica Navy SEAL helmet in my office. I am more proud of that helmet than I am any George Bulldog helmet I got. It is signed by the guy who double tapped Osama bin Laden in his head. <laughs> 275 grain boat tail hollow point 556 five, bullets traveling at 2500 feet per second from about 10 feet away ended that dude's miserable existence some of y'all look at me like hey old baby it works <laughs> yeah it's good stuff hey man brother Dave give me a holler in here brother Dave Signed by Robert O'Neill, the operator. He's the guy that come in there and while that coward that sent them dudes to fly planes in the tower, that coward was holding his wife, hiding behind like a human shield. That didn't stop the Navy SEAL, son. Tap, tap, tap. Anyway, you glad he's gone? They got that by waterboarding. Then Osama, then, uh, well, not Osama, Obama. Same difference. <laughs> <laughs> Obama came in and he stopped using those messages. He told him, you can't do that no more. Well, you see where that's getting us to. Anyways, I'm just telling you, this ain't nothing new. Here they're going to examine these dudes by torturing them. <laughs> this ain't nothing new. And uh, he don't get the answer that he wants. You know, the answer he's looking for is, yeah, they escaped and we helped them out. But these guys just keep telling them, we don't know. What the hell are you? We can't even go. No, it's true. We don't know. That ain't good enough. Watch what happens. Acts 12, 19. And when Herod sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. Hey, y'all. This time, a lot of you might live together. You remember over there? We're going to get to it here in another few months. Acts 16. Paul's in the Philippian jail. And the Bible says they sung and praised God and the prison shook and the door slung open and the jailer sprung in and bought Paul and Silas and the prisoners had run and the Bible said the jailer pulled out his sword and was fixing to kill himself. Why would the jailer kill himself? Because he knows they're going to torture him to death for letting Paul and Silas go. In this day, it's different now. In this day, life went for life. You read about that, you want to write this reference down. 1 Kings chapter 20, verses 38 to 43, it talks about Ahab. God sentenced Ahab to death because God gave him a wicked king into his hand, the king of Syria, and God wanted Ahab to kill him, and Ahab let him go. And God said, your life's going to be for his life. Since you didn't end his life like I told you to, now I'm going to let you die. Life went for life. And that's what's happening right here. That's why, coming back to the resurrection today, that's why I go to Matthew 28. These soldiers that were guarding the tomb of the Lord, Matthew 28, watch this. That's why when they realized Jesus was gone, they didn't just run back to the head centurion or run back to Pilate and tell them, tell Pilate, they're gone. No, they knew we're going to lose our life because that guy's out of the tomb. So look where they run to. Matthew 28 and verse number 11. Matthew 28, 11. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city, the guys that were watching the sepulcher. Some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. How come they went to the chief priests? That's not your superior. Pilate and 
Because this is your spirit. Yeah, but they don't want to pilot me certain off with the head. So they go to the chief priest and watch what happens. Verse 12. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers. Money talks. Saying, say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while he slept. Now watch what they're going to do for him. Verse 14. And if this come to the governor's ears, if this comes to Pilate's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. We'll make sure you don't lose your life. You just do what we told you. You say the party line, they stole him. Here's your money. We'll make sure y'all will end up getting killed. And they say, God bless you, we appreciate it. Verse 15. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So there's a lot going on here. And I can go back to Acts 12. You know, when you just read a verse like what we've read, Acts 12, 19, when Herod sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers, commanded them that they should be put to death, and he went down to Judea Street to read a boat and a boat there. You know, you just kind of read that and you think, well, that's no big deal. But I really, it kind of gives you understanding in a lot of other passages of the Bible. Why does the Philippian jailer want to kill himself? Because he knows he's going to get tortured to death. Why does the guards guard Jesus too? Go to the chief priests and not go to Pilate because they know they're going to get tortured and killed. So, Somebody help us out with this thing. All right, so we've seen the escape of Peter, the execution of James. Now let's look at the ending of Herod. Herod's end. And we're going to find that in verses 20 to 25. This is the guy who kills John the Baptist. He mocks the Lord Jesus on the night of his trial. He murders James the Zebedee, the brother of John, and he locks up Peter with the intent of killing him. And this dude, y'all, is about to reap what he has so, mark this down. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Somebody said, the wheels of God's chariot turn exceedingly slow, but they do turn. And old Herod looks like he's going to get away with it. He's going to get away with killing John the Baptist. The forerunner of Jesus, the cousin of Jesus. He's going to get away with it. He's going to get away with mocking the Lord. He's going to get away with killing James. He's going to get away with locking Peter. No, he ain't. <laughs> Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Amen. Yes, he will. And the Lord's, he's keeping good records. Y'all don't worry about bubbling idiots like Joe Biden up there. Amen. I, you know, these, these people are reprobates. On March the thirty first, I know next. I know next year, March the thirty first, it'll not be Easter, but it is this year, and it's not a coincidence that on March the thirty first, that yesterday or the day before, the president of our country comes out and declares today the resurrection day of our Lord. He comes out and declares today to be National Transgender Day. Did you know that? Yeah. You, you should. It's a national. It's a, it is a national uh, edict or whatever from the president. Look it up, read it. I'm not. I'm, this isn't like some you know conspiracy theory. This is, they put it out with the White House letterhead. The whole nine. It's real. Joe Biden declared today. It's not by accident. It is a it is a personal affront and a poke in the face to every Christian in the world. Right. It is a spit in the face of God. Amen. That on the day when all these Christians are going to worship Jesus getting up from the grave, hey, watch this. National, national Sodomite Day. National Transgender Day. National Day to celebrate what? To celebrate a bunch of degenerates? To celebrate a dude wanting to dress up like a woman? To celebrate a woman who's so confused and so mentally sick and sin sick that she wants to dress up like a man? Right. Come on. Yeah. So that's that's our nation. That's our president. That's our nation. So I don't vote for him regardless. He's the one running the country, y'all. I mean, to a certain degree, you know how much you think that too. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
I don't even get me started. <laughs> I mean, to, to a certain degree, whether you think he's running the nation or not. National, I, I mean, I, I really don't care what, which way, you know, Democrat, Republican, I, I got my own beliefs on that thing, whatever. But surely nobody in this room could ever halfway agree with the president standing up and making national transgender day. Amen. On Easter of all days. And you sit there and say, where's the justice for this? Don't worry. Don't, don't fret. The Bible says, this is what the Bible said in, in Psalm. It said, fret not thyself because of evil doers. In other words, don't, don't let yourself just constantly worry about what they're doing and fret because of them. I'm not. God's got this. The whole crowd. On the right, on the left. And the Lord's going to handle all that, y'all. Whether in this life or the next, He will handle it. Amen. And, and He's fixing the handle old hair. You know, you think, man, he's going to get away with it. All this stuff he's going to know, he's not going to get away with it. Verse 20. Watch the ending of Herod. Verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. Now, the Bible does not tell us what he was displeased about. But something uh, in this town, in this region, he was not happy with it. So it says, but they came, these people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came with one accord to him. And... Having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. These people aren't stupid. This is, um, you say, what did we just read in verse 20? You know what you just read in verse 20. You read politics the world over. What you just read was political prize for the good of some country or group of people. Blastus is Herod's chamberlain. The word chamberlain means like a steward. Like somebody who's been entrusted with something and he takes care of something. I don't know what he took care of for Herod, but he took care of something for Herod. He was in Herod's cabinet. And so this tyrant Zion says, man, Herod's mad at us. Let's make him our friend. Let's get him on our side so that Herod stays on our side. Does this not sound like the Republican and the Democratic Party? I mean, this is the Bible is so up to date. And so they, they make this guy their friend. We want him to be our friend so that way Herod becomes our friend. If you want to know more about Chamberlain, just do yourself a cursory search through the Bible. The King Bible will interpret itself as a building dictionary and the word Chamberlain is, is easily found. 2 Kings 23, Esther chapter 2, Romans chapter 16. It's easily figured out what a Chamberlain is just by reading the Bible. Verse 21, oh, Herod's getting his come up. Here you go. And upon a set day, Herod, now watch this. Don't miss this next little set of words. Arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. I was reading here this week when I was studying this, and there's not much said in Scripture here about this royal apparel and such as that. There's a little bit, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the old Jewish historian Josephus, I don't know if any of y'all ever read anything behind Josephus, he's just a fellow who lived back in these times, and he wrote a lot of things about historical records. Josephus has a very detailed note about the ending of Herod and about this right here. This is what Josephus said. Josephus said that this royal apparel that Herod had, it was a garment that was made totally out of silver. Holy of silver is what Josephus said. And he said Herod came into this theater to make this speech early in the morning when the sun was just rising up and shining bright. And they said when Herod stepped up in that all silver robe gown, it just blasted light, you know, like the sun reflected off this silver gown of error. And when these people saw all that brightness and all that, they said, it's a God. And he pulls the wool over. And the Lord's fixing to kill him for not giving God the glory for it. We'll look at that in just a minute. But I wanted to say this. This, this crossed my mind. This may be more. Maybe this isn't it. But you study this out. The Bible said he puts this royal apparel on, <coughs> makes a speech, and it makes these people say, that's a God. Do you realize that Herod 
Go back with me, if you would, to Luke 23. Watch what Herod does to your Lord. Watch, watch this. The, the, the Josephus said this royal apparel put on this shining silver garment. <laughs> watch Luke 23 and verse 11. Luke 23, 11. The Lord is the night leading into his crucifixion. Luke 23, 11. And Herod and his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. You say, that gorgeous robe, that's the purple robe. No, it's not. The Bible said, you look at another, I think it's John, the Bible tells us it's the Roman soldiers that put the purple robe on him. This robe is one that Herod puts on him, and then when he sends him away, he takes it back. They're the ones that put the purple robe on him. I looked up that word gorgeous in the text there. It said they put on him a gorgeous robe. The word gorgeous means shining. Like the robe that Josephus said he was wearing the day he stood up and they called him God. Shining or magnificent. I thought to myself, maybe one of the reasons God killed him is the robe he's wearing on the day he makes this speech and tries to take glory as God. It's the robe that actually laid on the back of the true God. And now Herod's trying to wear the same clothes that the Son of God wore. What a wild thought that is, man. Herod trying to don the same apparel, the same clothes, and act like, I'm a God too. No, you're not, sir. That was the one true God, the Son of God. Watch God give him. Verse 22 says this. Acts chapter 12, back to Acts 12, verse 22. It says the people gave a shout, saying, they're shouting now, is the voice of a God and not of a man. Now, obviously, this is those people from Tyre and Sidon trying to get back on Herod's good side because Herod's been mad at them. Obviously, this is, a lot of this is just flattery. They're trying to get on Herod's good side. What better way to get on a narcissist's good side than flatter him? Herod's a narcissist. He's all by himself. Always read about Herod. He's about self. self. He's, he's narcissistic. What better way to get on somebody who's a narcissist? What better way to get on their good side than say, oh, you're, the, you're wonderful. You're a god. But Herod doesn't care that it's flattery. He's so taken with himself, it doesn't matter to him that they're flattering him. I'll say this, praise and honor. The Bible says give honor to whom honors do. The Bible talks about the virtuous woman, her children shall praise her in the gates. Praise and honor are not a bad thing, but flattery is never a good thing. See, praise and honor can be rooted in truth. I praise my children for something they've done right. I honor my wife for something that she does or whatever. You know, that, that's one thing. But flattery? Flattery is never truth. It's always an over-embellishment of something. Watch what your Bible says about flattery. Go to, go to uh, Psalm with me. This is Herod here in Psalm. He likes to hear the flattery. <laughs> Psalm 36. Psalm chapter 36, verse number 1. <coughs> Psalm chapter 36 and verse number 1 says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. That's Herod. Verse 2. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. That's Herod. Go to Proverbs 29. Oh my flattery. Proverbs 29. And uh, verse 5. This is what those people are doing when they're calling Herod to God. It's not, it's not going to help Herod. It's going to hurt Herod. Proverbs 29, 5. A man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Why is that? Why is it that a man who doesn't give honesty not praise or honor or honesty, but he gives flattery. 
Why is that? Why is that spread the net for his neighbor's seed? Because his neighbor gets lifted up in pride and then always proceeds to destruction. I'm all for, like I say, giving honor to whom honor is due and such as that. But be careful about flattery, child of God. Even with your children. If a man thinketh himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceiveth himself. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a father. You know, what was that somebody said? There's two, there's, you know, two things you should never listen to. You know, not never listen to it. Should put all your eggs into these baskets. Don't put all your eggs into flattery or into criticism. You're somewhere back in the middle. You ain't never as good as they say you are, and you probably ain't quite as bad as they say you are. Somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said, if a man thinks ill of you and talks bad about you, said, don't rebuke him because you're worse than he thinks you are. <laughs> I mean, that's true if, if, if you know, if somebody really knew the real you and the real stuff you've really done, such as that, they'd really think bad about you. Uh, at least you can say, thank God no one left. Anyways, back to our text. Back to our text. He's getting flattered here. What's going to happen when he gets flattered? Oh, he's just getting all puffed up. And watch what God's going to do. Acts 12, 23. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. Why? Not because of what they said, but because of what he did. <laughs> what did Herod do? Because he gave not God the glory. Now, I've told y'all this before, and I'll tell you this again over and over. God will share a whole lot with you and me. He's such a benevolent God, kind God, gracious God. He'll share His grace with us. He'll share His, he share his Son with us. He'll share His blood with us, His heaven with us, His spirit with us, His mercy with us, His word with us. He'll share a lot with us. I'll tell you what He won't share with any of us. That's His glory. Amen. Not unto us, O Lord, Psalm 115, 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. The Bible said, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Here's what the Lord said in Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42, verse 8 says this. I am the Lord, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Amen. I'm the Lord, and I'm the only one that deserves the glory. Yes, you are, Lord. And so why does God kill old Herod? Because he doesn't give God the glory for what's been done. Amen. And watch what God does. This is a good man. This is messed up. Verse 23. God's going to do a little torture in himself. Herod tortures them guys back there in verse number 20. Y'all sitting there getting squeamish about torture. God thinks he's going to do a little torture in himself. Watch what God did. And he was eating the worms. Y'all, oh, 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 that's before he died. <laughs> that's right. Calm him, and he gave up the ghost. Even Josephus writes in his works that in this point, right after Herod made this oration, that Herod fell sick in his abdomen. They History describes that possibly it was some sort of cyst or something that bursted in his bowels. They said for four to five days, this is history, for four to five days, Herod laid up in his house in excruciating pain and literally had worms coming out of his belly before he died. Worms eating from the inside out. Who done that? Shocking news update. God. Amen. God has... Brother, can you imagine? This guy lays there for five days in excruciating pain, worms eating from the inside out. And I guarantee you, while he's laying there, the Holy Ghost is saying, Remember John the Baptist? Remember that man you arrayed in that gorgeous robe and mocked him? Remember old James, that great preacher you cut his head off? Now you get what you deserve. You'll play with a lot of people. You won't play with God. I'm telling you, I, I played with a lot of people before I played with God, His church, or His word. 
I wouldn't mess with that. The worms ate him. And he died. Good gracious, man. Don't you love the Bible, though? Watch verse 24. This has been a real cheerful Sunday school time. <laughs> Torture, worms eat people, waterboarding, old Tom and Lot done. It's been a real cheerful Sunday school time. Heroes, heroes. <laughs> Verse 24. But, I love, I love the conjunction. Isn't that awesome? Herod's eating the worms. Herod's giving up the ghosts. But, Herod's there. He's gone. But, the word he didn't like is still kicking, baby. <laughs> but the word of God grew and multiplied. You ain't gonna get rid of that book. I'm done here. Old Voltaire, the great French atheist that said Christianity was for the feeble minded and said all kind of nasty stuff about God and the scripture. Voltaire said this. Voltaire said, I'll get rid of every Bible in France. There won't be a Bible left in a hundred years in France. Voltaire died, and on his deathbed, Voltaire screamed this. He screamed, Oh Christ, oh Jesus Christ, and died and went to hell. And you know what happened to Voltaire's house? The Geneva Bible Society bought Voltaire's house some years after he was dead, put a print press in it, and started printing Bibles in Voltaire's house. And he's still printing Bibles today. Voltaire's dead got eaten by the worms and the word of God's growing and multiplying right out of that joker's house. Amen. You ain't going to beat the Lord, brother. You might as well join up with him. As the old timer said, join up with him. Amen. And then we find in the last verse of our chapter there, they take Paul and Barnabas. They end up taking Barnabas' nephew, John Mark, with them to go on the mission trip together. And, um, He'll end up being a staple in the Bible. He writes the book of Mark and um, controversy surrounding him later on, which we'll get to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I'm so glad the word of God is still growing. It's still multiplying. God, religions have tried to stop it out. Kingdoms and kings and, and Lord, nations have tried to stop the word of God out. Think they're going to get rid of it. They're not going to get rid of it. Lord, your word... The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Not one jot nor tittle from the law will pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Thank you, Lord, that your word is alive. Lord, it's still able to change hearts and do something in lives. I pray you do something in somebody's life with the word of God this morning. God, thank you for it now. Help us, Lord, to take these things to heart. Make sure we give you the glory in our life and do what you call us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.